Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our next session. Jeff Porter is our speaker for this session, and he has over three decades of litigation and transactional experience and is widely recognized as one of the top environmental lawyers in the country. He is currently the chair of environmental law practice at Mintz and an international law firm. And Jeff frequently writes on environmental law topics, including Clean Water Act issues, uh, coastal resilience, waterfront development, and PFAS liability. Today, he's going to be speaking with us regarding lead and PFAS exposure. And just as a reminder, please send any uh, questions that you have using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. We'll be monitoring the questions throughout the session. And um, hopefully we will get to answer all of them uh, before our session ends today. Um, with all of that housekeeping taken care of, um, I'll turn it over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Elizabeth said, I'm going to talk to you a bit today about what EPA is doing um, to address lead and PFAS exposures. If you think that's an odd combination, I agree with you. Um, lead's something that we've all been dealing with since the 1970s, PFAS has um, arisen as a major issue much faster. Um, what they both have in common is that in both cases, lead and PFAS, EPA has, has made it its business to deal with any, basically any detectable concentration of either of these things, given the human health risk that the agency is associated with exposure to lead and PFAS. Uh, there's some other differences and similarities that we'll talk about um, along the way. Um, next slide, please. So just to make sure we all have the same basic grounding, um, there's nothing new here. Um, for decades, EPA has regulated work in areas um, of homes and child-occupied facilities that are painted with lead paint. These are the formal EPA programs. And generally speaking, they require that if you're renovating, repairing, or painting a home, uh, a residential facility, or a child-occupied facility that that has had that that was built before 1978, which is when lead paint was um, no longer on the market, then you need to use people who are trained and certified um, in EPA-approved practices um, that that you monitor conditions while the lead paint abatement is going on. And, and then EPA sets standards both for permissible concentrations of lead, um, dust, and also soil. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily pay attention when they're removing lead paint from outdoor surfaces um, that the EPA regulations also speak to um, preventing lead from entering the, entering the soil as a result of that removal. Um, next slide. So just to get your attention and as evidence of the um, the seriousness with which EPA is um, addressing the perceived um, lead risk, um, this past summer, we had our first um, felony prosecution um, under federal environmental laws relating to improper um, abatement of lead of lead paint. Um, in July, this gentleman, uh, Mr. Ricky Lynch, pled guilty to charges related to the removal of lead paint from a home in Freeport, New York. His guilty plea came the day after his trial started on charges of allegedly violating TOSCA, the Toxic Substance, Substance Control Act, obstruction of justice, and other offenses. Um, EPA alleged that Mr. Lynch had, among other things, failed to provide prior notice to EPA of the lead abatement work that he and his people would be doing, that he had no occupant protection plan in place for that work, that he conducted that work without controls and without necessary supervision by the EPA, by I'm sorry, by an EPA certified supervisor. And um, in the uh, just another proof, more proof for the proposition that the cover up is often worse than the crime. Um, he also allegedly concocted a scheme to conceal his violations. Um, next slide. Um, EPA and the Justice Department acknowledge that this may have been the first time that charges were brought for violations of the EPA requirements applicable to lead paint. 
Now, on the one hand, you might be thinking, well, lead paint hasn't been used since the 1970s. We're almost through the first quarter of the 21st century. So um, fewer and fewer um, residential buildings might have lead paint. Um, e EPA uh, thinks that lead paint is still very much an issue and that a disproportionate percentage of the lead paint um, is in environmental justice communities, which is very much a focus of, of the current EPA. Um, and for that reason, EPA um, in, in October of last year unveiled a strategy to reduce lead exposures and disparities, um, which pledged a whole of EPA approach to address the presence of lead paint in underserved communities. Now, increased enforcement isn't explicitly mentioned as a strategy in that whole of EPA approach, uh, but, but given what EPA perceives to be a risk for millions of people, it isn't hard to imagine that that whole of EPA approach might involve more cases like the case that we saw in New York this summer, which would mean that while that may have been the first felony case relating to improper abatement of lead paint, it, it, it may not be the last. Um, next slide, please. Another thing that EPA has done, and, and this is quite recently, the public comment period just ended um, last month. Um, EPA proposed more stringent requirements for lead paint removal. Um, one of the new rules would reduce what's called the dust lead hazard standard um, from an already incredibly tiny concentration, um, 10, 10 micrograms per square foot on floors and 100 micrograms per square foot on windowsills to basically any, any reportable concentration, any detectable concentration of, of lead dust. And the clearance levels, in other words, the levels that one has to achieve when one has dust uh, lead above the standards, you then have to abate it and you have to abate it to what's called the dust lead clearance level. And that's been reduced from again these very tiny concentrations that um that the the that were the prior clearance levels to what EPA believes are the lowest post abatement dust lead levels that can be reliably and effectively achieved. So again, very a uh, very low tolerance for lead in dust um, in connection with abatements, uh, you know, at, at any detectable concentration. Uh, next slide. Moving to lead in water, um, which has been very much on EPA's mind um, since the Flint, Michigan situation uh, five or six years ago. Um, EPA is also devoting considerable resources to trying to remove the lead that remains in, in uh, pipes used to provide drinking water. Um, according to EPA, there are still several million lead service lines in use. Again, a significant number of those lead lines are in environmental justice communities. Not surprising since um, one would expect there would be less infrastructure um, replacement in environmental justice communities than in, than in more affluent communities. Um, the bipartisan infrastructure law, one of the two major spending bills um, uh, in the Biden administration allocated 15 billion with a B uh, to the replacement of lead pipes uh, through the Drinking Water State Resol Revolving Fund. Now we're gonna talk about PFAS in a, in a couple of minutes. The Drinking Water State Revolving Fund has also been at the center of federal and state efforts to remove PFAS from drinking water. Same law, different use. 49% um, of the funds will be allocated as grants or principal forgiveness loans, and the other approximately half will be accessible as low interest loans. Unlike many federal state funding programs, the state doesn't need to match those funds in order for them to be available. It's available not only for publicly owned uh, community water systems, but also for privately owned community water systems. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the definition of a community water, water system when we talk about PFAS, but, but it can involve water supplied 
uh, say, for example, to a privately owned subdivision. Um, and um, you can find contacts if you happen to uh, be involved with an entity that qualifies for this funding and you're interested. Um, you can find contacts for the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund people in all 50 states on EPA's website and the site uh, that the, the website references here. Uh, next slide, please. So turning to PFAS, so this again, lead goes back to the 1970s. PFAS go back, um, the use and manufacturing of PFAS goes back a long way um, to around the, the end of the Second World War. Um, but the, the concern about PFAS and human health risk associated with PFAS is much, much, much more recent. Um, uh, and really, EPA only got involved in earnest with the, with the um, Biden uh, administration EPA PFAS roadmap um, in October two years ago, which was a very aggressive multifaceted strategy for addressing PFAS um, with very aggressive deadlines, most of which um, EPA is a little bit behind in meeting. Um, but in my opinion, that has as much to do with how um, aggressive the deadlines were to begin with as it does EPA really trying to, try, trying to get there. And again, like lead, um, and contrary to EPA and prior administration administrations, um, this EPA has expressed a concern about human health effects associated with PFAS at basically any detectable concentration um, in drinking water. Um, so what do we know? Um, we, we know that EPA in many states say they're an urgent public health and environmental program. Um, I'm sorry, environmental problem. Uh, we know that they're very complicated substances. According to experts, there could be more than 6,000 of them. The current EPA rulemaking is to make two of those 6,000 hazardous substances under CERCLA. There are about 14 of them, which are generally discussed in the drinking water um, regulations and standards. Uh, they're a, that those, whether it's two or 14, that's a very small percentage of the total number of PFAS out there. Like I said, we know that they've been used in many products um, since the Second World War, and they've been released to the environment for that long. Um, this figure uh, on the right from the Michigan Department of Environment um, shows uh, the loop that, that has PFAS uh, used entering the environment, um, and then uh, and then and then and then cycling. Um, PFAS can be emitted in air emissions in concentrations that are very tiny but sufficient that when uh, those emitted PFAS are then precipitated back down to uh, to earth, they they create a PFAS circumstance. Um, they can cause PFAS concentrations in drinking water that in EPA's mind require um, uh, require action. Um, we we first started calling PFAS um, forever chemicals. Um, we can also call them everywhere chemicals because they're 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 present pretty much from coast to coast, including because of the fact that they can be atmospherically deposited, including in, in addition to being released from facilities. Um, they're very resilient. Uh, they persist in the environment and they also persist in living things, which is why we call them forever chemicals. Some PFAS last in the human body for hours. Others of them last in, in, in the body for decades. And we've gotten really, really good at finding them. Um, I'm old enough to remember when parts per million, when analyzing something in parts per million um, was an aggressive goal. Uh, well, well, PFAS are detectable at concentrations as low as parts per quadrillion, which is a thousandth of a part per trillion. So we're talking the tiniest amounts um, and the drinking water standards are, are, are set in parts per trillion, um, which is basically at the limits of detection. Uh, next slide, please. Jeff, just a question regarding PFAS uh, 
Are there any known side effects uh, to having these in your drinking water? Have they been linked to um, any type of diseases? Well, that's that. What, what a great segue to the first bullet on this slide. Um, so EPA uh, through ASTR, the Toxic, Toxic Substances Registry, uh, did a human health risk assessment, which is what drove the Biden administration EPA PFAS roadmap. And PFAS, as if if you if you've listened if you listen to the radio. Um, you can't avoid the advertisements from plaintiffs' uh, firms um, asking, you know, saying that uh, um, if you were exposed to PFAS and you um, and you have any one of a number of diseases, um, you should call them. And that's because the human health risk assessment says there may be, not that there is, but there may be a relationship between exposure to PFAS. Again, primarily by drinking water impacted by PFAS um, and, 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 and several cancers, um, thyroid disorders. Um, frankly, the commercial um, on the radio will do a better job of capturing all of them than I will hear. But yes, EPA is of the view that there's a potential relationship between the presence of PFAS and several diseases, including some cancers, um, as well as developmental, de uh, developmental delays. Um, but we don't know at what level um, any of these thousands of chemicals called PFAS collectively actually cause adverse ecological or health effects and what ecological or health impacts they might cause. And by the way, I was going I was going to ask for uh, people to respond in comments if, to who this um, gentleman is on the slide as a trivia contest. But I'll just tell you, uh, this is Paracelsus, who was the first toxicologist, um, he's responsible for saying that the dose of something is the poison, that anything is um, is toxic at a, at a, at a given dose. Um, the other thing we don't know a lot about is how to destroy them. So the main way of dealing with PFAS, particularly in drinking water, is to use um, filtration to remove these minute concentrations of PFAS from the drinking water. Um, while that's very expensive, it's doable. Um, what 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 we don't really have any sense of how we would uh, of how we would address the circumstance is PFAS that are in the environment other than in drinking water and drink drinking water because so far the only reliable way to remove PFAS in the environment is to dig them up and 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 then dispose of what you remove and and as I say on this slide we don't have any reliable estimate of how much that might cost. The American Water Works Association estimated the cost of treating PFAS impacted drinking water at somewhere between three and thirty-eight billion dollars. That estimate is um, that estimate's a couple of years old. I, I, I'm quite certain that more than three billion dollars nationally has already been spent on on treating drinking water, and and that that thirty-eight billion dollar estimate might actually be might actually be low. Um, next slide. So the other interesting thing about PFAS, as opposed to if, if, if like me, you're old enough to remember the advent of federal environmental laws and the sorts of things that state and federal governments were concerned about, um, EPA was late to this, um, to the, uh, I guess what I shouldn't call, but I will call the PFAS party. Um, PFAS, PFAS, uh, it was the it was civil courts that really led the way, um, uh, spurred by a movie called Dark Waters, as some of you may have seen. Um, uh, it it was it was civil courts around the country that really uh, that's where the PFAS uh, wildfire started. Then several states imposed standards, including I'm I'm speaking to you from Boston, Massachusetts. Massachusetts was one of the first states to impose a, a water and soil um, cleanup level for PFAS and identify them as hazardous substances under our state Superfund law. So it was first the civil courts, then states, and then EPA getting involved. You can see here 
This is a web page from one of the dozens and dozens of personal injury firms um, that you can find on the internet. That, as you can see, you can schedule a consultation if you think you've been exposed to uh, exposed to PFAS about about obtaining representation. And these are some of just some a handful of cases. Um, I just I just list these for purposes of illustration. The top two are the most important. Um, one is a multi-district litigation in South Carolina, a major settlement of part of that multi-district litigation has been proposed, which I'm going to talk to you about in a minute. Uh, there's also a personal injury MDL, multi-district litigation in the Southern District of Ohio. That's because the former DuPont facility that was the, um, the star of the movie Dark Waters is right across the river in West Virginia. You can see that um, entities responsible for legacy liabilities of, of PFAS manufacturers and PFAS users are suing each other. Um, and several states are suing manufacturers and users of PFAS over um, impacts to water supplies in those states um, uh, associated with the presence of PFAS. But, uh, and as I just see here, we're getting, we're just getting started. This is a, um, what's going on in the courts around PFAS to me is unrivaled by anything in my close to 35 years of practice um, other than asbestos uh, litigation. It, 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 it is um, it is a major phenomenon. Uh, many, in my estimation, many companies will not survive their PFAS liability. Uh, next slide, please. So, for folks that um you know know anything about Superfund, which was passed in the nineteen eighties. The uh, Superfund litigation really got off the ground around 1986 and continued into the mid 1990s. And then it was over and some of us thought it was over forever. Um, we're seeing, uh, you know, uh, this is one of my favorite movies. It's basically like Groundhog Day for environmental lawyers. We're seeing the same people arguing about the same legal issues. It's just, it's about a, it's about a contaminant that we didn't know about in the late 1980s. Uh, early 1990s. So, so in in court, we're arguing about property damage. We're arguing about allocation of liability uh, for PFAS between different um, entities in the chain of getting PFAS from manufacturer to the environment. We're talking about trying to divide um, a PFAS liability for which unrelated entity that unrelated entities may have contributed to. Um, we're talking about what you need to do about it uh, to be protective um, uh, and, and the costs of doing it. And in some of these cases, we're starting to, to talk about, not in my jurisdiction, uh, because Massachusetts doesn't um, recognize uh, this as, as, as something that one obtains for tort relief, but in many of other places, we're talking about medical monitoring of people that have been exposed uh, to PFAS. Uh, next slide. So as I mentioned, um, one of these two multi-district cases um, before Judge Gergel in South Carolina, uh, this is the, I thought, I think it's a quite beautiful federal courthouse actually in Charleston. Uh, poor Judge Gergel was assigned to this multi-district litigation, which has many, many facets involving literally hundreds of, of plaintiffs and defendants. Um, just before, and, and the way Judge Gergel decided he wanted to approach the thousands of cases that he was assigned was to hear what he called bellwether cases. Um, the first bellwether case was a case in Florida brought by a uh, municipality against PFAS manufacturers that um, the municipality, municipality held responsible for the a municipality's need to treat PFAS in its drinking water. Um, the week that that trial was supposed to start last summer, um, well, one of the defendants had already filed for bankruptcy, um, but 
but two of the other defendants and the I would call them the main defendants, um, what I'd refer to as the DuPont entities, which are current DuPont and other entities um, responsible for DuPont's legacy liabilities, uh, notably a company called Chemors. Um, the DuPont entities and 3M entered into separate settlements, uh, not just with the city that was about to um, begin its trial with them, but with all of the public water supplies um, in the United States. Um, and we're going to talk about the definition of public water system because it might apply um, to some of you. Anyway, these two settlements, the DuPont, what I'll call the DuPont settlement and the 3M settlement, commit up to $13.7 billion over the next seven years to remove PFAS from drinking water. Now, if you remember that $38 billion um, estimate from the American Water Works Association, um, in, the, in, in, in the Inflation Reduction Act, Congress dedicated $10, million, $10 billion to removing PFAS from drinking water. This is 13.7. Uh, that's 23.7 of that 38. And 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 I haven't read or heard anyone that thinks that's going to be enough. Anyway, it's 13.7 million. Most of this, uh, over 12 billion, um, is from 3, 3M and about 1.7 billion is from DuPont. The money from 3M is over time, um, assuming that they're still around to be able to pay it. Um, so what is a public water system? A public water system is any system with at least 15 connections, so not many connections, or regular service of at least 25 um, residents. Now, regular service, um, it means at least 60 days a year. So um, it, that's much more than just municipalities. And if you look at the two exhibits, where class council have attempted to identify who they think belongs in these in this settlement class. Um, it includes um, private entities. And so if you are, if I don't know a lot about all of you, obviously, I can't even see you or know who I'm talking to. But but if you have, for example, a housing development with many, with many homes and you and you purchase water from what I would call a wholesaler, a municipality or, a, or authority, but then you distribute it to more than this number of, uh, of people, you might be a public water system and you should talk to your lawyer about that. And the reason you should talk to your lawyer about that is this settlement is what's called a class action settlement. And what that means is notice has been published to everybody that the defendants and the class council think should be in the settlement. But whether or not you receive that notice, once this settlement is finalized, you're governed by the settlement. Every public water system as defined in the settlement agreements will be governed by the settlement agreement, which will become a judgment of the federal court in South Carolina and you will be governed both by the rights that are in that settlement agreement, but also by the obligations in that settlement agreement, which include a very broad release. So I've, I've, I've indicated some relevant dates here. Objections to the DuPont settlement were due by the 4th, and objections to the uh, 3M settlement are due by November 11th. And then opt-out notices. What an opt-out notice means is you tell the court, the class counsel, and the defendants, uh, no, thanks, but no thanks. If we want to make a PFAS claim, we'll bring a suit of our own. And, and every public water system in the country has the right to do that. Um, you have the um, you have to give that opt opt out notice for the DuPont settlement by December 4th and for the 3M settlement by December 11th. Again, even though both of these settlements happened at the same time, there are separate settlement agreements, separate separate notice requirements, separate objections. The terms are slightly different. Um, so it, it's really two, two settlements going through the pipeline at the same time. The judge is going to hold two final fairness hearings, one in December 
and one at the very beginning of February. And then the judge is going to move on to claims against other defendants. Um, the judge seems to be, uh, based on a notice that the judge um, gave uh, about a week ago, it looks as if the judge next wants to have a bellwether trial of a personal injury case. Um, so it looks like that might be the next bellwether uh, case to get to get the judge's uh, attention. And as I said, when I was referring to the fact that the 3M payments are being made over time, uh, there's tremendous uncertainty about whether the fund will be sufficient to pay all of the claims. It's pretty clear it won't be sufficient to pay all of the claims that would be made in full. Um, actually, um, illustrative tables have been provided in the settlements to give um, entities a chance to try to see what they might recover from the settlement. Um, in some cases, that it can be as, as little as 20 cents on the dollar. Um, and as I said, it's also unclear whether these settlement defendants, the settling defendants, particularly 3M, um, that is paying these claims over time, uh, will survive their other liabilities in order to make the specified, uh, to make the specified payments. Um, next slide, please. That's it. Um, I don't know if we have questions, but thanks for listening. Um, like I said here, if you're interested in Clean Water Act and PFAS issues, um, I frequently blog about them and you can follow me on LinkedIn um, uh, and be great to have you as a reader. Thank you so much, Jeff. Just, uh, you know, giving us another thing to worry about here in, in risk management. Uh, so we always appreciate uh, being informed about kind of what's up and coming. Um, so we do appreciate that conversation. We do have a, a couple of questions and we, I believe we have about 10 minutes. Um, so there are some questions regarding uh, lead. Um, one of them is regarding um, prioritizing cleanup in certain units that we know there are small children uh, that are living in those units. Is that something that they should continue to practice? Yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the things, so again, to distinguish between PFAS and lead, base any pediatrician can determine, you know, whether a child has been exposed to lead at a concerning, at a concerning level. And, and the connection between that exposure and, and very specific medical issues is pretty well defined. So yeah, I would be, I, I would certainly be prioritizing not putting myself in a position where I had a tenant um, with those lead levels that could be attached to uh, he or she living in, 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 a, in one of my units. Um, particularly in this current EPA um, environment that the, the we're, the we're living in, where EPA really has identified um, risks, particularly in environmental justice communities, as one of its, its highest priorities. That kind of leads into the next question. Um, what do you feel is the biggest mistake that you see landlords making when it comes to lead? Yes, yeah, so I think that, um, frankly, I think, and maybe this is why EPA took the action that it took this summer, I think property owners became complacent about lead. It had been so long since people had purchased lead, you know, lead paint, lead gasoline. I, I, I think it wasn't as front of mind as it might have been 20 years ago. And so... Um, People, landlords arranged for work. Um, they got an attractive bid. They maybe weren't as concerned as they maybe were 20 years ago or they should be now about making sure that the that the bidder had the, you know, the right certifications and expertise to do the to do the work. Um, so I'd say um complacency is the greatest mistake. And and I'm, you know, frankly, in my practice, I'm seeing that not just with lead. Um, I'm also seeing it with asbestos, um, where 
when asbestos first was a big thing, people were very concerned about making sure that the right people with the right personal protection were working in areas where there might be friable asbestos. And um, I, I think that not because it wasn't a, um, a conscious effort, but people just became more complacent and, and stopped thinking about, gee, I'm ripping this floor up. What is the regulator gonna think about what might be there and what I should have done to determine what, what was there before I ripped the floor up? Um, so I guess I could have had, it could have been lead, asbestos and PFAS that I talked about. To, I think everything that I said about lead is also true of asbestos. Like if you're doing work in a building that might have asbestos, um, you can't assume that somebody before you took care of it. Um, that 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 is another thing that the regulators are. Um, I think they're. I think the regulators see the same complacency that I see as a lawyer for the regulated community and are taking actions to try to reverse that complacency. I had a please too. Another question, we, I just want to comment that we do see a lot in asbestos tiles, um, you know, when we have workers come in after there's been a fire, um, always having to test that area specifically to ensure that, you know, when we do put people in there to make the repairs, um, that they do have the proper equipment. Um, and leading into the next question, when you are doing that type of work or those types of renovations, should you be concerned about neighboring units um, or should you be notifying the residents that there's this work is taking place and that there is this possible exposure? I, I don't, I don't think, I mean, it. that's going to depend on the given circumstance and the work, but I think the containment that you have to do to comply with the regulations would be sufficient that other units shouldn't be implicated as long as you're doing containment, as long as sufficient containment is possible. But that's going to depend on, you know, a fax that that's some that's something that you would ask the contractor in that the the the, the sufficiently trained and certified contractor in that circumstance. It could be that your containment has to be of more than one unit, even though you're only working in one unit, depending on how they're connected. To each other, but um, but generally speaking, if the containment is sufficient, it shouldn't implicate other units. And just a final comment, also a question, probably also to you, just from your experience and what you're seeing in the market. Um, but we do just want to note that we do have um, a PFAS exclusion on our insurance coverage that we provide. Uh, to our insurers and that if you do have any concerns or questions regarding your coverage to reach out to um, your um, associate that, that can assist you in, in finding coverage. But I know you have some thoughts around um, PFAS coverage out in the marketplace uh, that we had discussed uh, before. Yeah, well, the thought is that unfortunately there's not much. Um, <laughs> and that has to do with the magnitude and that will change over time, I think. Again, if past is prologue, that will change over time. But but right now, the insurance market is, um, you know, to use a legal term, completely freaked out about PFAS. And and, um, you know, when I'm talking to folks that are in the business of buying and selling businesses that may have PFAS exposure, that's already a real issue because you can't, um, the first reflex is, well, let's find insurance to, 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 to allocate the risk. And it's, it's just, lots of people will tell you that they're selling PFAS insurance and there is PFAS insurance out there, but, and this might be a slight over generalization, but in my experience, the PFAS insurance that's available, if you qualify, um, you already you either aren't going to have a problem within the policy term, or you already have a problem, which is going to be excluded from the coverage you're going to get. Like the terms are so short 
um, and the policy limits are so low that I just if anybody if anybody finds meaningful PFAS insurance out there, please contact me using this uh the information up on the screen. I'd 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 love to hear about it myself. We also just want to mention too, we know a lot of people are going through and purchasing land or having land donated to them from the city um, for redevelopment and new construction and just make sure that you know exactly what you're getting into um, when you do go into uh, that type of contract uh, so that you can make sure that yeah, I mean, you're, you're kind of covering your bases. Yeah, I'll give you just one quick example on that about PFAS, not but also could be true about anything. Um, so one of the main ways that PFAS have gone in into the environment is AFFF, firefighting foam. Um, the reason it was really effective is it had a lot of PFAS in it. And so basically, if you own a piece of real estate where there was a fire and the fire department fought, fought that fire with, with, P, with, with AFFF, even if the fire was 20 years ago, you still have regulatorily significant concentrations of PFAS in your soil and groundwater um, associated with that fire 20 years ago. So yeah, diligence is as important as it ever was. We will end it on that. I do wanna thank you all for your attendance and also thank you, Jeff, for your time and your knowledge today. Um, I think this was a great conversation and we will send out uh, follow-up materials to everyone. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at our next session. Thank you so much again, Jeff. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.